Hello and welcome back to the show. We have got a very interesting interview for you today. We're talking to psychotherapist Nicole Sachs, who is about to tell us that the root of our chronic pain or chronic conditions might not be a body issue, but actually a mind-body connection issue, an emotional issue. Trust me, if you have any issues with chronic pain or anything of the sort, you are going to want to tune in for this very insightful interview. Let's get into it. Well, Nicole Sachs, thank you so much for making yourself available for our show. I can't wait to dive into your incredible story and amazing methodology of dealing with chronic pain. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So I'd love to, yeah, let's dive straight into that story. Um, I know um, we've heard a little bit about it and particularly through our friends that love your work. Um, Yeah, I'd love to hear more about how you got into this field um, and the sort of alternative approaches that you found have been a major breakthrough for you. Yeah, awesome. So um, I like to say that I came by this work honestly because it was it started with my own body, and um, and I love that that is the case because it gives me such a special empathy for people who are suffering. Um, so when I was 19, I was in college. I was a freshman, and my back went out. What most people would describe as their back going out. I was I had a complete acute pain incident horrible lower back pain, stiffness, um, seizing up of the muscles, and I couldn't walk. And I had to literally be brought home from college by my parents. And I underwent all the tests. Um, I had MRI, x-ray, orthopedic surgery consults. And what they found was actually on paper very severe. So I am diagnosed with a condition called acute degenerative spondylolisthesis, you know, say that 10 times. <laughs> and um, it, uh, it's an abnormal, uh, it's abnormalities of the lower spine. I have a vertebrae that is shattered and replaced with scar tissue. And I have stress fractures above and below that missing vertebrae. And the way my lower spine looks apparently to those who are experienced Um, is incredibly scary. You know, I say that my MRI makes orthopedic surgeons go pale. They do. I watch the pity in their faces when they see it. So when I was 19, I was told that I could no longer travel, exercise, um, ride in the car for more than 60 minutes because of the bouncing motion of the car, lift anything heavier than 10 pounds. And the likelihood that I would have a biological child was very slim because if I stressed this condition too much, I could end up in a wheelchair or I could end up not being able to walk. And it was a very dire diagnosis. It was very, very serious. And so I took it seriously. I was young. Um, I was of course devastated, but I think there's something about youth where like, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing. But you know, like I didn't take it maybe as seriously as I would, you know, at my age now. And, um, and so I did have to take steroids and painkillers and muscle relaxers, but my pain kind of calmed down from this acute to sort of a more chronic pain. Like I had, you know, back problems. I finished up my undergrad and I was living in New York City and I came across the work of Dr. John Sarno. Now, um, I don't know if anybody out there has heard of him. He has um, several best-selling books. He was an attending physician for 50 years at the Rusk Center for Rehabilitation at NYU Medical Center in New York. So um, I had never heard of him until... Rosie O'Donnell, who had a talk show at the time, had a producer on who was in a motorized wheelchair. And um, she had this segment called Fix Jeanette because Jeanette had been to every single specialist, every medical treatment, every um, consult, and nobody knew what was so wrong with her knees and her feet that she could she was degenerating to the point where she couldn't walk. So she had this segment on called Fix Jeanette, and apparently people just called in in droves and they said, she has to check out the work of Dr. John Sarno. So my mother came across this, she brought me into it, and I started to research Dr. Sarno. And what I started to learn is that we live in a mind-body system. And although in many ways that are real, there's nobody saying that the pain is in your head. Trust me, my pain was not in my head. It was in my back, it was in my body, and it was killing me and stopping me. Even though your pain is real, there is, there, are, there is brain science that has to do with the way we wire to trauma, the way we wire to repressed emotions and to unfelt feelings that, that make our brain go into a sustained fight or flight space 
where our body is susceptible to all sorts of different syndromes and symptoms and conditions, including lower immune system that makes people continually ill. And so I understood the concept and I really embraced it. And I thought to myself, okay, Dr. Sarno says that spondylolisthesis is real, but it's just a normal abnormality. Maybe I was born this way. Maybe I did, you know, I, I rode horses as a young girl. Maybe I did fall and but it's like, even when I think, even when I think of that, I'm like, if I had fallen off a horse and shattered my spine, I do think I might've <laughs> noticed, but <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, it's funny. Cause every time I tell the story and I think about the horse thing, I'm like, Nicole, that is so dumb. You would know if you shattered your spine. Anyway, <laughs> I was probably born with this condition probably. And nobody would have known it unless I had back pain. And so one might say, but Nicole, you had back pain right where you have an abnormality. Yes. However, that is part of the brain science because, and I'll explain more about this, but if the nervous system and the brain have to choose between what hurts and what hurts worse, and the repressed emotions represent a predator that can kill you, the, it will choose the path of least resistance in order to get your attention. And I do have a weakness structurally in my spine. So essentially I understood Dr. Sarno's work and I understood that this could be as real as real could be, but the genesis of my pain could be in my mind body, in my emotional world. And so I started to research and do the work and my pain went away. And what's interesting, and I tell people this all the time, is recovery is not a straight line. So that's not the end of my story. Um, and I'll just, I won't go into super detail, but the way my story went is I did have two biological children. I exercised till the day they were born. I was, I, I was rollerblading. I was playing tennis. I was traveling. I was living the dream. And then when my son, my little one who was 10 months at the time, now he's 16, was walking in his little baby walker and I picked up his walker to move it and I felt it like a hot knife dragging through my back. And one of the things that I think is super important for people to understand when they're looking at mind-body work is the number one thing that helps the brain and the nervous system understand that we are safe is belief belief. It's, it's kind of like faith. It goes hand in hand with understanding what's going on in your body so you don't get triggered into fight or flight. And when I felt that pain, I immediately thought, well, I did it now. All that mind body stuff was BS. It went out the door and I was like, now I'm, I'm ruined. I'm broken. And I went through a year of very terrible chronic pain and a lot of depression trying to parent my kids. And it was at that point that I had what I think is a bit of a spiritual awakening. I had a very low moment where I was trying to get my kids into a car and my back seized up and I couldn't get them in the car and I couldn't let go of their little wrists in an active parking lot and I was just standing there sobbing. It was just a really low moment and it made me realize maybe there's work I need to do. Maybe there's more to this. And that's when I actually went into New York City and met Dr. Sarno, did his work with him and understood that there is very deep emotional work that every human being needs to do. This is not just for people in chronic pain. This is for people who are not getting enough joy out of life, who think things should be more beautiful, who don't understand why they're not connecting with people, who are struggling with their relationships, who are struggling with their self-esteem and their self-worth. This work is so transformational. And when I really understood it, that's when I did the deeper work. That's when I, and so, so, now I'm 48, so it's been about 15 years since I've had any chronic pain at all, zero. I had another child. She's in seventh grade. She just got braces. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm just, I, I, and so I've, I've, used, I, I've used my education and my practice. I worked with Dr. Sarno for years at NYU. I lectured with him. Um, he referred into my practice. And now I've taken my work, elevated his work, um, and he passed away a couple years at the uh, years ago at the age of 94, he lived a brilliant life. And so I'm taking his work and now making it available to everyone. Wow. That is what such a story. Yeah. That's an incredible story. And I know so many people would relate to that, you know, doctor diagnosis or just that feeling of being stuck or, yeah. you know, maybe they've had a bit of a breakthrough and then they've relapsed and then they're like, well, here we go again. So I, I think, thank you so much for sharing that. And obviously my mind is going off with questions. So I'd love for you to like <laughs> dive straight into how, what is going on with the science of this? Because it sounds obviously to some people it might sound like a little bit like woo woo, maybe even yeah. the sense that they would be like, 
I don't even want to believe that this could be true because I've suffered with so much pain my entire life or anxiety, depression or whatever that that is. So I'd love for you to dive into the science of it and just the mechanisms of what's happening. Okay. So the most important thing for people to understand when I lecture to large groups of people, I walk in with an Etch-a-Sketch. Do you guys know what an Etch-a-Sketch is? Mm, My God, you guys are so young. Is it that magnet thing? Is it it's, the magnet it's, drawing it's, thing? It's, it's sort of, okay. Like so it's like, it's like, oh, yeah, it's that's like, what I'm thinking sort of, of. It's, sort of it's, like, it's like an OG um, uh, iPad, okay? Okay, okay So cool. it, it's it's a toy that, that I, I grew up in the 70s that um, it's like a, like a red frame and you can take the little dials on the toy oh. and you can make a picture. Oh, yeah, See, yeah, yeah, look, yeah. I watch your uh-huh. eyes lighting yeah. up. You. Uh-huh, okay. yep. <laughs> that was the older kids though. I never played with them. Yeah. I had cool things. Magna Doodle was way better. <laughs> yeah. Doodle's awesome. And actually, it's sort of a similar mechanism, Constant, which is yeah. once you make the picture on the Etch-A-Sketch, the way to erase the picture is you shake it. And what I say to people when I begin my lectures often is, listen, each of you has an Etch-A-Sketch in your mind. And it's a picture that comes up when you think about what it means to be sick or what it means to need help or what it means to need to go to a doctor or what it means to even be someone's daughter or be someone's mother or be someone's wife or husband. You have an image that comes up. It's a complicated image. And if I'm trying to work with that image and if I'm trying to take my little Etch-A-Sketch dials and, and help you understand, if I draw on top of that image, it's going to be very hard for people to understand. So often what I say is, before you listen to me right now, I invite you to shake your etch sketch. Just clear it out, you know, clear it out and get yourself clear because what I'm about to say is not what you've been taught growing up. In fact, I look at my five children because I have three biological and two step kids and I think of them as sort of like patient zero. I am raising the generation of people who when they feel pain in their body, don't think something's wrong with me. They think what's going on? What am I feeling? What am I not feeling? And they ask for help and their pain goes away. So I have five kids. So of course, within the course of my household, we have stomach issues, we have anxiety, we have headaches, we have achy backs and achy wrists and knees and shoulders because this is called being alive. But instead of them saying, something's wrong with me, I'm broken, we need to go to the doctor, my son will come to me when he has a stomach ache and say, oh my God, I'm having one of those anxiety stomach aches. Can we talk about what went on today for me? That's the stuff. So I guess I want to say that I'm going to explain the science, but if people come to it with sort of um, a defensive posture, they miss the opportunity to really learn what I'm saying. So essentially, here's how I understand it through Dr. Sarno and through many, many brain scientists that I've studied with over the years. We live in a mind-body system. Sometimes we feel things in our hearts, in our emotional world, and sometimes we feel things in our bodies, and they are literally interchangeable. So what I'm saying, people already know, meaning, you know, I often say, raise your hand if you've ever had a stressful day and gotten a headache, right? Every hand goes up in the room. Did you go the next morning for a brain scan? Ha, 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 no. I didn't think I had a brain tumor. I knew I was stressed out. A lot of people were asking a lot of me. I was really, really, I had it up to here and I had a headache. So then I say, who's ever gotten a call, you know, maybe 11 o'clock at night and it's your mother. (gasps) My stomach goes sick. What does she want? What's wrong? Why is she calling? Your stomach goes sick, but not because you ate bad food at dinner, which would be a physical reason, because it was triggered by an emotional response. A number come up on your phone that maybe makes you feel like there's going to be some bad news, right? Your boss says, hey, um... Sarah, could you come and um, have, a, have a talk with me in my office immediately, right? Your, your mouth goes dry. Your throat gets closed. There's nothing wrong with your saliva ducts. You got scared. So, mm-hmm. so people know that an emotional stimuli can cause a physical reaction. The most obvious one is what happens when you're really, really sad? The saddest you ever get. Water falls out of your face. It's crying. (laughs) It is a physical reaction from an emotional stimuli. So I think it's really important that people know that what I'm teaching them, they already believe. Every person believes those things that I just said. The problem is when things become chronic, when things are labeled as autoimmune disease, when we get a diagnosis, a label, anything that causes us to feel broken and scared and powerless, that emotional and physical um, connection goes out the window. 
and we go from you know specialist to specialist and treatment to treatment. The, the connection though is the same. So the way it works in chronic illness is for our entire lives, we as human beings are required to repress emotions. It's a defense mechanism and it's super healthy because when we repress things, we don't have to be paralyzed with the great emotional reaction to everything that happens in our life. You know, you're getting ready for work, your kid's having a meltdown, you have a fight with your spouse, the dog, you know, poops on the floor and you're like, ah, the way that makes you feel could stop you from being able to go to work. So what do you do? You take a good 70, 80% of that, you repress it, you take a deep breath, you do some of your mind mindfulness exercises and you go to work and you can manage your day. But there is stuff that gets banked. And of course, that's like a silly example, but there's real trauma that gets banked. And there's childhood experiences like bullying and like abuse and neglect and, you know, going from the simplest thing, like moving schools and not having friends to the most horrible things like severe trauma. And we need to repress them in order to live a human life. So what happens in almost every chronic condition is that reservoir of shame and fear and rage and anger and sadness and grief and unfelt trauma, they live within us. And when that reservoir threatens to spill over and inform our conscious brains of how angry or scared or sad we are about the lot we have in life, there is a natural nervous system and brain reaction where it flips us into fight or flight because a predator is here. This, These repressed emotions are viewed by your brain and your nervous system as a greater predator than your physical pain. Your physical pain, your migraine disorder gets you to go lay down. Well, what happens when you go lay down? Okay, well, you get people feeling worried for you and sorry for you. You get to cancel plans without people asking you to explain yourself. You get to ask for help without feeling weak. Win, win, win. The nervous system mm. is in a dance of happiness because you have succumbed to the most protective mechanism that our body can offer us. And that is what I call safe in the unsafest way. So really what's happening, and this is the science of it, is as these repressed emotions struggle to rise, it triggers in our brain and our nervous system different physical problems. I call it like a pinball machine. You pull back the ball and it could be like headache, stomach ache, shoulder pain. Like there's many people that I work with have many different diagnoses and discomforts and symptoms. And um, it's all coming from the same place. This brain science, what's amazing and, and literally magical in the most honest sense is when people go through the systematic unearthing of their repressed emotions, which is the work that I teach, the pain signals stop firing. Regardless of diagnosis, I have people who I've worked with who have been diagnosed with autoimmune disease, let's say lupus. I can't say whether or not they still have lupus, just like I still have spondylolisthesis. If you MRI'd my back, it would look the same, but they've gone now two, three years more, and they haven't had any symptoms of lupus. So it's like, how do you feel today? You know, I always say, how do you feel today is the only question that really matters. I still have a diagnosis on paper, but it doesn't matter. You know, I just, I rode 35 miles on my bike today. That's actually the true story. I'm so wow. tired. But, <laughs> wow. but, but what I, you know, I'm in the, I'm in the U S so it's the night for me. But, but the point is like, this is, this is, this is real. This is not therapist talk. This is not woo woo. I am a spiritual person. That's separate of this. This is brain science that leads the body into equilibrium. And it, and when you go into le equilibrium, you go from fight or flight to rest and repair. And then you're, you're okay. Wow. This is like, <gasps> I love this stuff. This so is so good. cool. Um, so what is that process? So say someone's listening right now going, okay, uh, sign me up. <laughs> like uh, I'm over these pain medications, et cetera, et cetera. I've suffered from autoimmune disease for so long. I've had depression and anxiety. It's been crippling all my life. Well, how do I start? What's, what's step one on the journey? Okay. Well, there are three facets of my work. Believe, do the work, and patience and kindness for yourself. And all three are equally important. So believe. I think it is so important, like first, like in your example, there's someone new who's watching this video and they're like, okay, sign me up. You need to move yourself into alignment with this. 
You know, I really love to say, I don't care what decision you make in life, just come into full alignment with it and you will have success. And so full alignment with the belief is that I think it's really important to educate yourself on exactly what I'm saying. So maybe jump on over to my YouTube channel and watch my Healing Yourself series. It's free. I have over a hundred episodes of my podcast. Listen to them. They're free. Read Dr. Sarno's book called The Mind Body Prescription or listen to it on audiobook. Educate yourself. So when you start doing the work, you are like, I'm in because your brain is desperate for your, your input. So the brain and the nervous system are not emotional beings. The brain and the nervous system are operating most often, or at least the primitive brain that I'm talking about in your brainstem, which is the reptilian brain. It's the place where we keep ourselves alive. So this is a very black and white kind of thinker, this part of your brain. There's no shades of gray. You know, like when you put your hand on a hot stove, you pull it off. You don't sit for a moment and think, hmm, how might it feel to pull it off? You know, you just, you yank it right off because your brain and your nervous system are responding before your consciousness is. And so I think it's really important when people are doing this emotional work to have themselves aligned with what they're doing. So that's believe. Do the work is my journal speak practice that I teach. So do you want me to kind of dive into that yeah, whole that thing right now? Yeah. Okay, sure. So journal speak is a language that I learned to speak when I was doing this work for myself. And it, yes, it is a journaling technique, but it's way different than any journaling technique I had, I had ever seen before. So essentially when I w work with Dr. Sarno, he explained to me that the best way to get a landscape of your life, what I like to call it, Google mapping your life, you know, pulling out so you can see the entire landscape of your life is to make three lists, childhood or past stressors, daily life and personality. So the childhood list is a bulleted, this whole list is a bulleted list. It is not something that you have to, um, ha that anyone else needs to understand but you. So it's a, childhood is a bulleted list. So like, for example, the biggest parts um, of your childhood that still cause conflict would go on there. So like, I would definitely put the name of every member of your family. For me, like the concept of money, the concept of my parents' divorce, the concept of moving house, like the things that affected me deeply as a child. But then, you know, that time in fifth grade on the playground or, you know, the way my father pressured me about getting straight A's or my breakup with my best friend in seventh grade, like things that you look back on and you still get that little feeling like, you know, there's something else left around that. There are things about our childhoods that we have come to peace with, but put everything on the list because as you're working through this work, the things that you've come to peace with will be obvious and they will just, they'll kind of flow right through you. And so I, th I really tell people to make it a comprehensive list. The daily life list is what you might imagine. Your, your partner, your work, your kids, your dog, your mother-in-law, your, you know, money, um, the coronavirus, you know, whatever, anything that is stressing you out. And then the personality list is really important. So there are types of personalities that I believe tend to repress emotions more. And the following are some of the examples of these traits perfectionistic. You're your own worst critic. You hold yourself to an impossibly high standard. It's very important that people think well of you. It's very important that people see you as a good person. It's very important to you that you see yourself as a good person. Um, codependent. So that means that like you need everyone else to be okay for you to be okay. You know, like, oh, you, um, you let people have what they need and then you go without. Um, you know, some self-pitying behaviors. Um, you don't like to um, cause conflict. So you don't want to speak your voice if it might make people angry or uncomfortable. You'd rather be uncomfortable than make the situation uncomfortable. These are the, now, now you listener might not find yourself in every one of those things, or maybe there's other personality characteristics, but whatever it is you think that really describes you, put it down because our personality is the lens through which we filter every single experience of our lives. And so, so much repression comes with simply being a perfectionist. You know, I am a recovering perfectionist myself and it's like looking in the mirror, I could fail. And like, imagine then how many times I have to fail a day, right? Or 
if I want to write something, if I want to write a piece of writing, I've already failed because I can read it again and be like, God, it's just not good enough. That's important to know about yourself. And so you make these bulleted lists and then you do something called journal speak. So I'll tell you um, a little story about how journal speak was born. Is that okay? Mm-hmm. Okay. Would love that. So when I was going through this really horrible acute pain incident, I had two little babies. My daughter was two and a half and my son was just um, 10 months old. They were really close in age. That wasn't the plan. Um, and I was overwhelmed. And so when I went over my daily daily life um, list, motherhood came up. And I had journaled. So I knew that I had to uncover these repressed emotions. Dr. Sarno had explained it to me. I'm in horrible, horrible back pain. I can barely breathe. I'm trying to sit up straight at the desk. I mean, it was really, really hard. So I put motherhood at the top of the page and I start writing. And I always say with journal speak, which this was the day journal speak was born, but now that I understand how to teach it, um, you start with the surface truth. You start like a court reporter. So I was. I'm so tired, but two babies in diapers, two babies in cribs. This wasn't the plan. It's too much for me. David works all the time. You know, I feel alone and I'm sitting there and I, this is where I say there is a spiritual aspect to this, certainly for me, because something kind of came into my consciousness and I was like, this is not the truth that's going to heal you. This is, this might be true, but this is not the stuff that is making your body so toxic with repressed emotions that you're going to die. And it just, I was on my knees with desperation and desperation leads to surrender and surrender leads to truth. And I wrote the first line of journal speak ever penned, which was, I hate being a mother. And I looked at it on the page and I thought, holy <laughs> I'm, I'm getting there. Something cracked open in me and I somehow beautifully, magically gave myself permission to really tell the truth. And what's very important about journal speak is it doesn't stay true. I am so blessed. My daughter's a freshman in college now. My son's in 10th grade. My daughter's in seventh grade. I have two stepkids. I live for being a mother. But that scared, sad 30-year-old woman who was overwhelmed beyond, it wasn't just that I was tired. It was that I hated it, that I felt trapped, that I was a failure, that I was ruining everything, and that I was never going to get out of it. And that's enough to put you into fight or flight to the point where your body wants to shut down. And I'm writing and I'm writing and I'm telling the truth, the ugliest, grossest, most unfiltered, most impolite details. And it just came out of me. And I remember sitting there and going, oh my God, it was the most incredible experience. And I woke up the next morning and my back pain was 80% gone. And over the next month or two with doing this journal speak process, going through my list, it never came back and it's been 15 years. Now, I have human pain, like everyone has human pain, but chronic pain is an epidemic of fear. And you can't have chronic pain when you're not repressing and when you're not panicking about what's wrong with you. So I have not had a minute of chronic pain since then. And so what journal speak is, essentially, is it's the five-year-old child that exists in all of us. So what I think people don't quite understand is that childhood is timeless. Childhood doesn't, the injuries of childhood don't just go away because we live long enough. And so when things aren't resolved, what they do is they cause a word that is a huge buzzword in today's society, which is triggers. And so, you know, you'll often hear someone say, oh, I was so triggered by that. Well, this is technically in terms of brain science, what that means. I'll give you a personal example. So when I was little, my father was an incredibly strict, I can't call it a disciplinarian, but I mean, he had ideas of the way I should be, of the way I should speak, of the way I should present myself, and of the way I should perform. I should get straight A's, there should be nothing less. And so I felt incredibly judged and criticized. So before I did that work, if somebody criticized me, you would have thought, I mean, I wanted to get into bed. And like we both know, especially depending on who is criticizing you, which could be some stranger at the grocery store being like, hey, lady, you know, whatever, I, I would want to get into bed. 
from the jerk at the grocery store. Like it, it's so clear when it's a trigger because it, it goes so beyond what the situation really calls for. When we don't do the, the inner work, we are triggered left and right by life. And that requires a lot of repress, repression and that get, makes us very sick and in pain. And so one thing that this, this journal speak process does is it gives a voice to this little five-year-old inside who is really angry that they have to be a grown-up. You know, as you get older, you know, you guys understand this. Adulting isn't easy. It's not fun. You know, all of a sudden you're out there in the world and you have to do all these responsible things and no one's patting you on the back and giving you an A for it, you know, and we're really actually quite angry about that, all of us. And we're also very self-pitying about that. And we're also sad about the parts of our lives that we wish were easier. That kind of stuff needs to be felt. And it needs to be felt in an incredibly impolite way, as if that five-year-old was talking. So in some journal speak sessions, you'll find yourself crying. In some, you'll find yourself raging and saying swear words and maybe talking not like a nice woman or man, girl or boy might speak. Um, it is an unabashed, impolite, unapologetic look at these topics. But what's really amazing, and I think people, as you know, you try this, you'll learn this, the journal speak doesn't stay true. It's just like, I have a client who calls it like cleaning out your refrigerator. So if you went out to the fresh market and you got all this beautiful organic produce and you came home and you opened up your refrigerator and it was full of rotting, stinky food, you can put your beautiful produce in the refrigerator. If you push everything back, you can probably fit it in, but it's toxic and it's not going to be the same. Journal speak is cleaning out the refrigerator. It's getting rid of all these repressed stuff, this ugly stuff. It will not make you hate your family. These are, I'm just like thinking about like my frequently asked questions. Mm. It will make you love them so much more. There are times where I have to journal speak about my family. I, first of all, let's talk about it. We're in a global pandemic. I have five children and a dog and a wife, and we live in a house that's like, not big enough. Okay. <laughs> None of us left. Nobody goes to school. A lot of journal speak, speak was required. <laughs> but if, if I go up here, I could say, you know, Oh God, it makes me crazy when you do that. And look, like awfulest things. And then I go down in the kitchen and I'm like, Hey guys, because you're not battling anymore with that ugliness that is there anyway. And I think that's what every person on earth needs to understand. If a tree falls in the forest and nobody is there to witness it, it still makes a sound. It makes a sound because it is ultimate reality that things that fall make sounds, whether or not you're there to hear it. So here's what I say. The falling tree of the way you feel about things, your frustrations, your anger, your sadness, your unspoken grief, that tree is falling every day within you. If you don't listen to it, it has to make a sound somewhere. So where does it make a sound? Ouch, 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 ouch. You will feel it somewhere. And so what my work does is it teaches you to turn toward these things, to acknowledge what's happened and what's happening, to come to peace, to come to self-forgiveness, to come to other forgiveness. It's, it's, you know, of course, way more complicated than one conversation can do justice, but that's the work. That's the work. And then of course, patience and kindness for yourself. I always recommend a 20 minute journal speak practice followed by a 10 minute loving kindness meditation. Bring yourself back into yourself. Understand that every human being has these feelings. You are not bad. You're not wrong. You're just saving your own life. And it's a 30 minute practice per day and it is absolutely transformative. Mm, so beautiful. Cool. I have many questions. <laughs> but first of all, um, I'm wondering, how do you help people not stay in that space for too long? Or what is the process there? So are you going into these deep rep repressed or like sad and hurting areas of our psyche and of our experiences? How do you help people not stay in that space for too long or what is what is what is the natural process there does your body naturally just come back out of it and you feel okay again or is it how long is too long to dwell on on these experiences it's a, it's a great question here's the thing this is where it comes that we need to shake our etch a sketch we're all so precious we're all so worried about feeling poorly about something but here's the deal life is legitimately a choice between what hurts and what hurts worse 
So here you find yourself, whomever you are. You're suffering in pain. You're suffering in exhaustion, fatigue. You don't have enough joy for life. You're not living the life you imagined. Here you are. What's the alternative? Do exactly what you're doing and have a different result? No. The alternative is to do this inner work. Is it going to feel terrible? Yes. Is it going to feel hard? Yes. Is it going to feel like you're dwelling on things? Yes. That's when we practice acceptance. That's what we practice. You know, um, Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. You know, this, this is a journey that must be walked in order for your, your health to change. You know, like there's no other way out than through. So yes, it is hard. And sometimes you do dwell and sometimes you have sad days. And you know what you say? This too shall pass. I'm having a sad day because I had to think about X, Y, and Z. That was really hard for me, but I'm here. I'm learning every time I have a sad day and I wake up the next morning and wow, I'm still alive. And guess what? I had a little bit more joy today. I realized that I can do this. So, you know, that's where the, the, the simple answer to your question, Sarah, is the 10 minute meditation, but the much more complicated, deeper answer is sometimes things need to feel hard for them to get better. And it's, there's a great deal of acceptance around having to do this work. People, nobody wants to do the work. I don't want to do the work. Nobody wants to do the work, but am I satisfied with a life that is less connected and open and alive? I'm not. So I'm willing to do it. That's so Beautiful. cool. Um, one of our mutual friends that uh, recommended to get you on the show was talking about an experience that he had where he wrote down, he did this thing and he wrote it down um, and scrunched it up or burned. I forget what he did. Yeah. Um, I like the burning thing because for yeah. me, that's like, like yeah. a mini burning man since ceremony. Um, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what he found was um, once he let go of some, it was like a particular issue to a, a someone in his life um, and he just let it go. There was this chronic pain in his shoulder that all of a sudden just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And then he was just like, that is so weird. Anyway, so he went to his massage therapist and they were looking at it going, oh, this is fine now. And I was like, and obviously this is when I was thinking, we've got to get you on the show. This is super cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how, what, how, how does, does the subconscious store pain in certain parts of the body? Is that, is that what's happening there? When, and when you let go of that, it's like almost like the subconscious connection to pain that's in a part of the body is released. And, and Am I totally yeah. missing this? You you're can correct totally me if I'm missing wrong. It. No, no, no. You're not totally <laughs> missing it at all. It's just a bit more. The the lens just needs to be op opened a bit wider. Right. So, okay. In this process that I've been describing, the pain signals can be channeled into any number of places in your body, which is one man's migraines is another man's fibromyalgia is another man's irritable bowel disease is another person's neck pain, back pain, shoulder pain, knee pain, hip pain, pelvic pain, uh, chronic fatigue, symptoms of autoimmune disease. Okay. So there's myriad ways that this mind body process can express itself in the body. There are two ways that I have observed this one where it's totally random. You know, a person just has trigeminal neuralgia. Okay. It's obscure. They are diagnosed with it. A person has, you know, back pain, but nobody in their family ever had back pain and there's findings on their MRI are fine. So sometimes it really is random and sometimes it's just this process is happening. It's expressing itself through your body and that's where it shows up. Much more often there is a logical explanation for it. For example, an eighth grade girl uh, blows out her knee and needs reconstructive surgery on her ACL in 1978. And now it's 2020 and her knee still hurts. Oh, but I always had that injury. You know, I did my knee in eighth grade and, and it's, that is so common. Or um, people go in for some sort of an x-ray or an MRI and there's something like a bulging disc. A bulging disc does not cause pain. I am brave enough to say, I've been doing this work for over 20 years now, so now I'm brave enough to not have to couch it a million times. A bulging disc does not cause pain. You think it does. The medical model tells you it does. It doesn't. And the reason I know it doesn't is I've worked with thousands and thousands of people around the world who have bulging discs, who have done this work, who no longer have any back pain for years and years and years. Bulging discs, similar to spondylolisthesis, are normal abnormalities of the human body changing, being bumped around. Maybe even in a perfect situation, we would have what are called bulging discs. 
Sometimes there's no incidental findings, meaning fibromyalgia. There's no way to know what fibromyalgia is through a medical test. It's just how it feels in your body. It's diagnosed through you going to a doctor and saying, I have nerve pain. It feels like there's electric pain going up and down. They'll say, oh, that's fibromyalgia. Now, there's no way to prove that, which is why people get very frustrated with that diagnosis. It's a real diagnosis. It is not in your head. It's just the way that this process is expressing itself through your body. So in your friend's situation, he had shoulder pain. Maybe there is a logical reason for his pain, maybe not. But as long as you have the right connection in terms of being a lot, like bringing yourself into energetic alignment with knowing that you're doing this work to heal yourself, any pain will go away. And I, and I, you know, it's funny because there's a couple lines of criticism that I get on a regular basis. And one of them is, it's irresponsible to tell people that any pain will go away. And I just have to apologize and say, I'm sorry, I can't not say that because I've had people from all walks of life. I have worked with people from my youngest patient was probably my eight-year-old daughter. My oldest was, I think, a woman in her 80s and everywhere in between socioeconomic status, different cultures from all over the world, different um, backgrounds and everything they all get well. So it doesn't mean that everyone's going to get well in short order. This work takes time and it's about rewiring your neural pathways. And so it's not, you know, an overnight process, but it, it really does work. Excellent. Mm, very I, cool. I, I heard you sort of touch on sort of that, I, I guess the controversy surrounding this, because but right now we look at the landscape, um, you know, pain is an epidemic and also is prescription pain medications, which is destroying a lot of people's lives. So I'm guessing there would be a lot of vested interests to, um, um, I'm curious with your mentor as well, what he um, maybe pro had to go through because there'd be a lot of vested interest to maybe not want that, you know, to want to, to get this message out to yeah. the people who need to hear it the most. Um, is that what you've experienced in, um, in your professional aspect of your life? I'm going to be honest with you. I feel really lucky that Dr. Sarno worked so hard and fielded so much of that negativity. He suffered. He was very dear to me. He was like a father. My father died when I was 27. And when I met Dr. Sarno, it was right after that. And I used to go into New York and sit in his office with him. And he would share with me um, the despair he felt from knowing this incredible information that could save so many lives and nobody wanted to hear about it. And he did have five best-selling books, so somebody wanted to hear about it, but I think a doctor of his stature wanted acceptance from the medical community. And he was an attending physician for 50 years, 5-0, and he never got a referral from inside the building once. What? He was ostracized by his peers because what he was saying went against, let's talk about it, the medical model, the surgical model, big pharma, everything that made anyone any money. <laughs> and it was just unheard of that our emotional world could be considered with physical syndromes. And now I feel that the consciousness of the planet is rising and shifting, that my work is actually very well received. And one thing that I really do make sure to do is I lead with my own experience, strength, and hope. So I'm not telling anybody how they should feel. I'm telling people how I have felt. That's hard to argue with. And also I am really backed by a tremendous rise in acceptance of this kind of philosophy. So I do get some pushback, not like I not even enough to complain about, really. Cause because also I say to people, Listen, my work has a hundred percent misery back guarantee. <laughs> Anytime <laughs> you want to stop and just go back to the way you're doing it now, I will still love you. My heart is still with you. Most people start seeing the difference and their body becomes their proof and then they don't need to criticize anything anymore. Mm -hmm. So cool. Very um, cool. I'm curious just before we sign off, uh, any uh, specific stories uh, we have a lot of people in our community that have a lot of gut issues. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same thing. Oh, you're going to ask the same yeah. thing. Yeah, I'd love to hear some any uh, case studies you've done with patients uh, or clients uh, that you've had, you know, people relieving autoimmune gut-related issues. IBS. Okay, so this is really important for people to understand. This goes, I'm going to keep going back to shaking the etch-a-sketch. 
if you are going with your old thinking, it's going to be very difficult for you to get better because your old thinking is tied very deeply to fear and to meaning. So if your diagnosis is IBS or any sort of an autoimmune thing and you decide, you know, I have this, I have this thing, this is something I have, I would really just invite you to replace your fear with curiosity. That's all I ask. You know, there's a very beautiful story called The Choice. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it. Um, she, it's a, She's a Holocaust survivor. Her name is Edith Eva Eager, I believe. And she's in her 90s and she's still a practicing psychotherapist in New York City. It's an incredible story. But she tells the story how when her parents were slaughtered right in front of her and she was brought to Auschwitz, she was able to survive as a 16-year-old girl by every time something happened to her, instead of paralyzing herself with fear, she would replace her fear with curiosity. And she would say, I know this looks like it's the worst thing that could ever happen, but I really wonder what's going to happen next. I wonder if there could possibly be a light. I w and I know this sounds completely insane, but she just put out a whole biography called the choice autobiography called the choice and i read it and and i and i use this concept in my work of replacing your fear with curiosity because imagine someone in the most unthinkable circumstance she did that she came through it and now she's 95 years old still thriving there's something to it <laughs> and so what i would invite people to do someone with gut issues to say okay I know I've been told I have leaky gut or I have SIBO or I have, you know, irritable bowel disease or whatever, or, you know, there's a lot of also things that, um, associated with like mold exposure, like a lot of things that make people very nervous, but just what if, what if those things were never really the reason for my pain? Yes. My pain is real. Yes. Those are my diagnoses, but what if my entire problem was always a result of this dance between my mind and my body and my nervous system and fight or flight. What if? Let me take my belief. Let me do the work. Let me practice patience and kindness for myself. Because even though the gut seems like it's a different question than your friend's shoulder, it's exactly the same. Some people have this express itself through the gut. Some people have them express itself through the shoulder or the headaches or the wherever else. It's, it's actually immaterial, the gut, in this, in this scenario. It's just the place where you're feeling this reaction from your sustained fight or flight, where your brain has kept you safe. Well, why? Well, if you have a diagnosis like that, maybe you'll stay smaller. Maybe you'll stay close to a bathroom. Maybe you'll interact with the world a little bit less. The world is dangerous and keeps triggering you. Every time you go out there, someone criticizes you and you remember how your father never approved. Come on, come on, let's go back inside. You know, it's a very logical thing when you think about it. So although your question is well taken, it's actually the same question as a shoulder or a headache or a fibromyalgia. It's just where it's expressing itself. And so for those gut people, it just happens to be coming through your gut. Great. I have a question about journal speak and how to really tap into what someone is really feeling or thinking, because I think for a lot of people watching that have chronic pain and if, if, um, speaking to the framework you put towards us today, um, these people are potentially the people that are really good at compartmentalizing. And so how do you, uh, get into a place where you really actually know what you are feeling if you're so used to shutting it off? That's why a journal speak practice is really magical because it's this kind of boundaried systematic exploration that doesn't make you feel like so overwhelmed. You make these lists every day. You have a practice. I, I really suggest people do it in the morning just so you can't excuse yourself out of it all day. You put 20 minutes on your phone. You turn it over. You don't watch it tick away. You put the little topic on the top of the page, either on your computer or on your written page, and you just go. You start like a court reporter, but when you get invited into those deeper places where those feelings start to rise, just let them come, let them come, let them come. 20 minutes, the timer goes off, you turn it off, you select all and delete. This is an immediate, this is my, one of my clients calls this, like she said, it's like blowing your nose. You're going to look at it again. <laughs> <laughs> just like flush, flush it down the toilet. You know, um, you were saying burn it, like 
Some people like to have a bit of a ceremonial moment and burn it in their fireplace or out in a, in a jar in their yard. Some people, I mean, I just type on my computer. I literally go nuts on my key computer, end of 20 minutes, I turn it off, select all, delete, don't save the document, it's just a purge. I sit down, I take my 10 minutes of meditation, I calm myself, I go out about my day. It's actually not overwhelming like that because you know you're doing what's right for you. It's kind of like if you wanted to get um, in shape. So you go to a personal trainer and they say, here's your workout. Do this on a regular basis. You're not going to see a difference every day. On almost every day, nothing happens. But you're going to look at yourself three months from now and you're going to be like, damn, I look good. You know, and that is, that's how this works. It's, it's not something that you can just kind of like, and, and here's another thing I just need to say in terms of, um, philosophy. Life is not a problem to be solved, guys. You know, we think it is. We love to check the box and say, this one's done, put a bow on it and move on. Your human experience starts now and it ends when you die. It started a long time ago and it ends when you die. Um, and maybe not, maybe it doesn't even end then, but at least the human part that hurts. And um, there's no getting it done. We're just trying to be here and be present as much as possible. And so it's not, it's not as scary as it looks to feel into these things and it can change your life in a pretty epic fashion. Wow. Thank you Beautiful. so much. That's so cool. And, um, I know so many people listening to this would be like, this is, you know, it's just wet their appetite for so much more. So mm. how do they get in contact with you or what's the best way to, um, you let you outline some steps before what is, what are the, some of the best ways that they can get in contact with you and keep going and diving deeper into this content? Yes. So the first thing I should say, definitely, because I get a lot of requests, is I do not see private clients anymore. I'm I'm too busy and I wish I could, but I also have the five kids. And um, I'm also really working now on elevating this message to the global community. So I So they can't work with me directly, but that does not matter. I have so many online resources. So I have a website called thecureforchronicpain.com. And on it, it has links on the resources tab to my YouTube channel, my podcast, my book. I have a book called The Meaning of Truth uh, available on Amazon. I have a private community on Facebook called Journal Speak with Nicole Sachs, which is a total private group. Nobody sees your posts but the members of the group where people are incredibly supporting each other all the time. I put new content every day out on Instagram. Follow me at Nicole Sachs, L-C-S-W, N-I-C-O-L-E-S-A-C-H-S, L-C-S-W. Um, and that is someplace I've put a lot of my energy lately, just creating a lot of content for Instagram. Much of my stuff that I do is free, but I also have an online course called Freedom from Chronic Pain. If you wish that you could work with me directly, I just have to be honest, take the course because it brings you, it has videos and guided meditations and original reading and writing exercises and art therapy exercises. It really brings you through my entire program. So that's a great way to do it. Um, and I also run online retreats. So I also usually have in-person retreats, but of course, 2020 has kind of uh, put the kibosh on that. But um, starting next summer, I will be also in person, so far just in the US. Um, I, I speak, uh, I do a five-day retreat at the Omega Institute in upstate New York and at 1440 Multiversity, which is in Northern California. And um, there's several other centers where I'm working with them, but you know, we'll have to see what 2020, 2021 brings. But um, I am doing a virtual weekend retreat. It's my third one. They are incredible and they are more connected than people realize, like they're really intimate. Um, and that's gonna be May 7th through the 9th. And that's also available to sign up on my website. Awesome. Well, so good. yeah, we'll leave all the there's so many notes there that um, people would be like, oh, I need to, oh, what, what what was that? So it's all in the show notes, <laughs> and um, make sure you get on and um, support. I think the amazing work that you're doing, and dive deeper, guys. I think that's the big message that we all need to, well, the newbies at least on the call, um, need to um, take away from this message. And yeah. I can't wait to do some of this myself and see what happens. Awesome. I loved that interview. I don't know about you guys, but that really resonated with me. I know it did with Matt. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, we'd love to hear from you. Please let us know in the comments. Have you heard about anything like this before? Do you have any personal experience? Have you heard of any other people, you know, dealing with their emotional issues and that resulting in uh, recovery from their pain? We'd love 
to hear about it. And as per usual, we would love it if you could hit like and subscribe on our channel. It really helps get this message out to people that need to hear it the most. But we'll see you next time. Stay safe.